Edward Steichen was a photographer and curator who had a very long career. In the early phases of his career, he was an intellectual collaborator with Stiglitz. And at other points in his career, he was a rival and they didn't necessarily see eye to eye in terms of what photography was really all about. In the early years, he was a, a key pictorialist and a strong influence as a photographer. He was strongly aesthetically motivated. He had goals for what photography could do as a fine art form, and he was deeply inspired by Whistler and by Japanese art. His photography from this time is characterized by dramatic atmospheric portraits and landscapes. Later on, getting into the 20th century, he served as an air reconnaissance pilot during World War I, and that changed his attitude towards photography. He was quoted as saying, anyone who uses soft focus should be court-martialed. Here's one of Edward Steichen's self-portraits. This is from 1898. So see how he's composed this very deliberately to crop off the figure right at the edge of the, um, of the frame and have a lot of open space in the middle. This is strongly inspired by what's going on in painting during that time. These paintings show you a little bit of the style that Whistler was known for. He was an American painter who was working in England at this time. So he's making portraits that are strongly motivated by compositional elements, by color and composition and balance and how the sort of visual components of the painting work together. So this is an approach to composition that is a strong influence on Steichen. And here you can see how Steichen uses these broad areas of dark and bold contrast with the smaller areas of light to create this sort of uh, mysterious atmosphere. Um, this is from 1910. So even during his pictorialist period, Edward Steichen was very highly respected for his portraiture in that style. So here he's made a portrait of the sculptor Auguste Rodin, and he's, uh, he's used this sort of differential focus uh, using a gum bichromate printing process so that you see um, depth in the photograph. You see um, the, the artist sort of profiled on the left. You see a sculpture just a little bit further in. Um, over on the right and then further off in the distance sort of brightened up you see another of his sculptures. So it's an unusual approach to uh, to using space um, in, the, in gum bichromate um, printmaking. But this is Edward Steichen as a pictorialist, very moody, very atmospheric, but still um, making photographs from life. This gum bichromate print was made in 1904. And it's great that you can see this in color because the gum bichromate prints, they were really labor intensive and they could use color in the printing process. A lot of, uh, a lot of photographers did that. They couldn't commercially reproduce the color. So the, so the photographs would be produced as gravures, but those would be in black and white and the original gum bichromates would have some color in them. And they would be unique because the color would be independently um, applied one print at a time. Um, this particular print of the Pond Moonlight set a world record for auction sales for a photograph when it sold for $2.9 million around 12 years ago. So then Steichen goes to war. So this photograph is made in 1918. Um, this is Steichen using, using photography from an airplane for military purposes. So he's not doing this to make art. But because of who Steichen is, the photographs that he makes during World War I are later collected and sort of like put into that archive of works that he does. And you sort of look back on this as part of his, uh, of, as, of his body of work as a photographer. Now, after World War I, when he comes back to the United States, he gets, uh, he gets established in commercial photography. 
He's especially sought after as a portrait photographer. He works for the magazines. So this is a portrait of the movie star Greta Garbo. He made lots of portraits of famous people during these years. And you can see that he's taking a simplified streamlined approach to the photograph, but it's sharp and it's clear and it uses a full clear tonal range. And he's using um, gelatin silver printing now rather than gum bichromate pr printing, which would have had that tactile feeling to it. Now, Edward Steichen came to work for the Museum of Modern Art after, um, after the 1930s, and he stayed with the Museum of Modern Art for a long time. His, his, uh, his title was the Librarian of Photography. They didn't have a title for a curator of photography at that time, but curating was what he did. He put together photography exhibitions, including this landmark exhibition called The Family of Man. It's from the 1950s, so this comes along later in his career. But this is to show that he had a very long and increased increasingly influential career in photography as time went on. So let's consider Paul Strand. So he's the uh, he's the young upstart. OK, so when he begins his career in photography, he is still a student of photography when he brings a portfolio of prints to Alfred Stiglitz and says, what do you think of this? So it's a bold move, but this is something that the young artists are doing when Stiglitz is running his gallery in New York City. The young artists want to go and put their work in front of him so that they can um, so that they can have a career in, in art and, and, and work with somebody with big ideas. So Stiglitz became a mentor figure to Paul Strand. And Paul Strand had the nerve to tell Paul to tell Stiglitz when he when they were having this this portfolio review, the Strand wasn't terribly interested in the sort of softness of the pictorialist approach. Strand wanted to approach things with more clarity and more sharpness. And that was what being modern meant to him as a young photographer. And this really changed how Stiglitz thought about photography, and he started using uh, gelatin silver prints with their sharp detail and sharp focus because of the influence of Paul Strand. So Paul Strand was emulating the influence of the modern painters that he saw at 291, um, but he's, he's doing this as a photographer. The themes in his photography include movement in the city. There are a lot of abstract elements and street portraits. The final issue of camera work was devoted to Paul Strand's photographs in 1917. It was just all his work. So this is one of Paul Strand's most influential photographs. This is from 1915. It's, um, it's sort of recognized as an icon of modernism. So if you just sort of visually take this, uh, take this picture in, look at how it's a street scene, but the people in the street scene are occupying a very small area of the space. Now, when you think of city scenes, you might think of buildings where you can see space in between the buildings, maybe even see uh, sky in the distance, but he doesn't do that. He frames it so that there's just this vast, very geometric, very monolithic looking wall behind the people. The lights coming very dramatically from one side creates very dramatic shadows. The figures of the people have just a little bit of modeling to them. They're almost like silhouettes. So it's a bold, modern approach to composition of a street scene for the time that he's taking this in 1915. And this is an approach to composition that really strongly influences Stiglitz. And as a result, all of Stiglitz's followers start to, uh, start to be inspired by this kind of photography. Another of Paul Strand's really well-known images, he's continuing to photograph on the street in New York City. So, you know, he's photographing real people, but he's taking this sort of modern, detached, compositionally motivated approach to street photography. And it's saying something about how we think about photography and how we feel about photography, what it means to see and what it means to be seen. Here's another of Strand's bold modern compositions focusing on the elements of transportation and what's modern and active and dynamic in the city.
So with photographs like this, you can see how Paul Strand is making abstract photographs. They're made of things that are in the world, but they're not a story of something from the world. They are about light and shadow, composition, repeated elements, a certain particular treatment of space. This is a way of using photography that is fresh and exciting in his time.